Justin Trudeau was talking about what was going on in the world. And, uh, and, and in the context of politics, he quoted Albert Einstein. You know, we cannot solve the problems um, with the same thinking that we used when we created them. You know, things like global warming, things like pollution, things like um, changing economic circumstances are problems that we've created. So to take us to the, the next level and evolve, we have to use different thinking um, to make that a reality. And that's a lot of what this talk is about. Um, uh, anyone here not heard of the World Economic Forum? Okay, so the World Economic Forum is something that takes place each year in Davos, and the great and the good get together. This is a short um, clip from this year's um, World Economic Forum about what they see going on in the world and um, it's a future perspective on what's happening. Oh, sorry. So this thing that is the, the fourth industrial revolution, how's the sound now? Is everyone good? Um, is, is something that's impacting all of our lives. It doesn't matter where we live, what we do, um, and, and you probably would think in terms of cooking and food design that that's an unlikely place to actually get ideas around what to cook. You know, it's, it's almost counterintuitive, the idea that a machine that can't taste, can't smell, can't feel full, can actually come up with recipe ideas. So we're, we're living in an age where the lines between what is the physical world and what is the digital world um, are blurring. And we're all experiencing this change at a speed and a scale and a force that's not being experienced before. We live in accelerated times of change. You know, and it's going to affect the very essence of our human experience. And following on from this morning, you know, what we taste, what we eat, is actually being affected by artificial intelligence already. So, you know, if, if we think in terms of this fourth industrial revolution, we're starting to experience the taste, or actually this morning we experienced a taste of what is to come, and it's, it's here already. It's amongst us. They're amongst us. Um, you know, radical system-wide innovation can happen in only a few years. So driverless cars, there is a strong probability that by 2030 we won't need to drive anymore. How many of you saw getting your driver's license as a rite of passage when you were 15 or 16 years old? That's changing already. 
you know, a lot of the millennial generation are not actually getting driver's licenses. They're quite comfortable taking things like Uber, um, riding the public transport network. But the driverless car is going to significantly shift a whole lot of things in terms of urban design. It's not going to be as important how close to work you live anymore because you'll be able to get into your driverless car and carry on work. Um, and this is a, a particularly interesting thing in terms of what Simon was talking about a little earlier in relation to the interplay between nanotechnology, brain research, 3D printing, mobile networks and computing. When he was talking about genetic markers that are going to help us understand what foods are appropriate for us to eat. So often when you're in um, the, the software business, we don't think about the interplay between the physical world through things like nanotechnology. These are really interesting aspects that are already starting to have an impact. You know, I'm not sure how many of you might have seen um, a Facebook post recently where um, it was showing um, a surgeon using a robot to uh, actually stitch up the skin of a grape. So, you know, we have the technology now to, to stitch the skin of a grape back together again that's split. Um, <clears throat> so, access to technology is going to spread like wildfire. You know, I don't think there'd be anyone here that hasn't had the experience of some sort of viral video, some sort of viral application of some sort. And I just want to put that in the context of business for a moment. So this is back in 2012, September 2012. These are all of the different um, applications that were available back in 2012 in terms of marketing. So you've got email marketing up here, testing opt optimization, SEO, uh, mobile gamification analytics. If we fast forward four years to February 2016, that's how it's changed in four years. So that's in the context of business. We're not just talking about consumer experiences of technology. This is how dense this landscape has become in four years. And just zooming in a bit further, because it's quite hard to read, um, you know, you're seeing a lot more players, but you're also seeing a lot of big players that weren't there before. So Salesforce appears here. Interestingly enough, IBM appears in a lot of spots across here. Your competition is going to come from places that you don't realize going forward. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And, and actually, to that particular point, almost anyone will be able to invent new products and services cheaply and quickly. Because we've got access to the platforms that it was usually only enterprise customers could afford to build applications on. You know, cloud technology, um, things like Bluemix. Um, the business models of each and every industry will be transformed. If you think about the music industry, that's a really obvious one. But anyone that's in broadcasting, um, media, and entertainment would have seen a significant shift in buying behaviors and how they make money um, over the last 10 years. Uh, I would suggest that there's not a single type of industry that isn't going to be affected by this change. And I think this is a really important piece. You know, we, we might think that the um, gathering of the great and the good at Davos is, you know, not for us because we're in business, we've got to make money. But what we do in business and the choices that we make around the technologies that we deploy, the choices that we make in terms of what we stand for can make a big difference to the world that we are now creating going forward. So, you know, it's your brand, it's what you stand for, it's the promise that you make that can make a very big difference to the outcomes that are delivered to customers. And, you know, if we want to continue as a species, it's a very real problem that we face in terms of things like global warming, plastics in the ocean, um, and pollution, climate change. So, <clears throat> Jeffrey Moore, um, has talked about uh, everyone is a techno sorry, technology company. So every company is a technology company now. Um, Forbes wrote about this a couple of uh, years ago as well. 
um, and Gartner have talked um, extensively about this. So back in the Industrial Revolution, the blue section here, it was all about mechanization. Um, then the second industrial revolution was about the production line. The third industrial revolution was about programmatic logic control um, and the use of the, the digitizing of vast amounts of information. We're now entering the age of cyber physical systems. So the connection between our human minds and robotics is a significant part of what the future holds. What's also very interesting to track here is that this here is the degree of complexity involved. So when we think about steam power uh, and coal and electricity, the levels of co complexity have gone up exponentially as we're moving through this. The types of data that we now have access to in terms of information has changed quite significantly. We now understand more about the world than we ever have. We also understand that the complexity of the systems are much greater than before. So embracing complexity is one of the key things that we have to think about in this mix. And it's, I would suggest that every organization now, now needs to think in terms of how do we use technology to gain competitive advantage. So if you're in the restaurant industry, for instance, and you're dealing with food allergies, Watson is a piece of technology that you can apply to come up with more interesting taste combinations than bland combinations of food if somebody is you know, allergic to dairy, for instance. So we live in a digital disruption, and Jeffrey Moore, who wrote Crossing the Chasm, has um, recently talked quite a lot about what's going on in terms of disruption. And he would argue that um, the, the disruptions that we're experiencing from a technology standpoint come in three categories. Those three categories are around um, the business model, business operations, and then IT disruption. And there are different categories because the types of things that are going on are changing things quite, quite significantly. So Uber is a good example of a business model disruption at work. You know, Fundamentally, you know, it's a car, it's a driver, it's getting from A to B, but the business model has changed. Um, there's no operational difference necessarily other than the use of mobile technology. Things like Apple Pay, for instance, are good examples of business operations and the type of disruption that's occurring around business operations. And the Internet of Things is another example, if you like, of how business operations are going to be progressively disrupted over time. Some of this stuff at the top here feels more big bang in terms of its, um, uh, the experience of it. This stuff seems more incremental and the further down we go here, the more incremental it see seems. Now, we've built up IT systems that there's a lot of risk around migrating to different um, uh, platforms around. So IT disruption is taking place at a different pace and in a different way to what you see at the top here. These are all important things to keep in mind as we consider um, how we're going to take advantage of this technological disruption that we live in and the fourth industrial revolution. So I want to give you um, an example of a business model uh, disruption. Um, so Airbnb, interesting phrase here belong anywhere. How many here have used Airbnb? Interesting to note. It hasn't ruined the hotel business, but what it has done is change your experience of visiting cities. It's an entirely different experience to stay in a home versus a hotel. And it's very interesting, this, this concept of um, selling belonging. You know, this is part of what the proposition or the experience is around Airbnb, is that you can create an environment where people can feel like they belong. That's not something that you would typically say about a hotel chain, although some people would, but they tend to be um, quite wealthy from my experience of such a thing. So Airbnb is another example of a business model um, disruption at work. Drone deliveries. There's a really interesting video of um, Jeremy Clarkson for any um, Jeremy Clarkson fans out there 
where he's um, actually promoting the Amazon drone delivery service in the UK. Um, this, is, this might seem fanciful in New Zealand where the distances aren't great and you know, it's probably easier to get in your car and go down to the shop, but distribution models and the, the things like drones are really changing what's possible because it's a lot more expensive to train pilots to do things and it's a lot more expensive to actually um, use helicopters to, to transport items. So uh, last week, we're talking with uh, Transpower. They're starting to use drones to inspect transmission lines. You know, it's much easier to send a drone up than it is uh, the, the cost of sending a helicopter up. So this is an example of an operating model disruption at work. And then with the infrastructure model that we're talking about in terms of IT, operations, um, you know, BYOD and the cloud are really having significant impacts in terms of the, the changing work environment. I mean, I, is there anyone here that actually hasn't brought their own device to work and doesn't use a personal device for work-related things? Okay. So most of us are now bringing our own devices to work. Most of us, I imagine, are using cloud services in a company, in the corporate environment. So these are all things that they're there. It's happening. This fourth industrial revolution is not something that's on the horizon. We're in the midst of it. And Watson is a good example of it. But also, here is a short um, piece from Cisco um, around the Internet of Things. And it's really how the operating model and the IT um, business model are coming together to really change our quality of life. This is the cat that drank the milk and let in the dog that jumped on the woman who brewed the coffee that woke the man who was late for work. And drove the car found the parking spot. Find parking space. Parking space found. That alerted the door that opened the control room. Hey, that secured the data that directed the turbines that powered the sprinklers that watered the grass and that fed the cow that made the milk that went to the store that reminded the man to buy the milk that was poured by the girl who loved the cat that drank the milk. The internet of everything is changing everything. So whilst that's a, a little bit tongue in cheek, what, what it's a good illustration of is two things. One is um, how technology is really starting to permeate our daily lives in ways that um, you know, we only dreamed of in years gone by. But the second thing is that what you're seeing here is a day in the life of someone. Um, and this is a very important concept when it comes to applying um, user experience design to product development. So more on that later. So the other thing that are really um, significantly changing things for us are apps. So um, it's also worthwhile keeping in mind that there are different types of apps out there that rely on different data sets. And some of the breakout groups are actually going to talk about how you, you look at structured and unstructured data and data lakes and data swamps, as I heard about last week. Um, it's Julian's favorite, data swamp. So, um, so on the left-hand side here, we have apps that help us transact and record. We also have apps that power things, and you saw examples of that in the video just before. We also have apps that enable us to delight and engage an audience. So, you know, Facebook is an example, Candy Crush is an example of something that engages and delights us. Gamification is a good example. And then there are apps that support how we live. And there are going to be some examples through here where you, you'll start to see how um, this line between what is an app and what is a physical or cyber system um, starts to um, come together. And this is all about um, you know, the underpinning to getting these apps to work well is understanding your business data, machine data, but most importantly, um, behavioral data. So understanding behaviors are really critical for us to start building user interfaces that are going to be meaningful and engage and delight. 
you know, so this is actually a statistic from HP. Um, by 2020, more than a trillion applications will be exchanging 58 zettabytes of digital data over 75 billion devices. So if you don't think the fourth industrial revolution is coming, um, there are plenty of people that do. So what we're seeing is a journey to a new style of doing business, especially within the context of IT. So systems of record are some of the things that you see on the left-hand side, and systems of engagement around customers, around prospective buyers, are what we're starting to see on the right-hand side. And we've got to be able to cater to both. So a lot of the, the systems that are of record are about managing costs. What we're moving to is an environment where we want to create outcomes. Now this is not news to those of you who are in IT. It's always been about creating outcomes. But there's a significant shift away from systems view of things towards human-centered design. And how do we actually make sure that the experience that the human being is having is relevant to that person in that moment? These are critical things to consider as we move through um, the journey in the fourth industrial revolution. So what we're seeing increasingly now, and here's um, one statistic, last year marked the point in time where the majority of the workforce are now in their 20s. So sorry baby boomers who are in the room, you're now in decline. The most significant people from an influence standpoint, not from a control standpoint, but from an influence standpoint, are your 20-somethings. Um, and those 20-somethings are forming these diverse groups that are helping redesign the experience that people have of your products, services, and of your brand. So we're seeing an increasingly diverse talent set and collaborative processes um, starting to occur within organizations. One of the critical underpinnings for that, though, is that we need to have a high trust culture for that to work. So you're seeing a significant shift in what we believe around what is important in terms of culture in the organization to help facilitate this sort of iterative, iterative experimentation and learning. What this process enables us to do is start with a minimum viable product. And it was actually Jeffrey Moore that started talking in terms of um, minimum viable product many years ago. Um, and uh, the Lean Startup sort of took that concept to the, the, the next level. What this ultimately means is that we can fail fast and we can fail cheap. And that's one of the important takeaways, if you like, in relation to user-centered design. That we want to be able to set up the conditions, and it is a cultural change, it's a mindset change that we have to think about, just in the same ways we potentially have to get our heads around what's going on in the fourth industrial revolution. We are having to adapt and evolve or change our thinking to make this happen. So we're seeing two speeds of IT. Um, you know, the, the, there's um, bimodal IT, which Shane is going to talk about a little bit later. Um, it, starting to impact the way that we deliver IT services across that, those three levels of disruption that you see there. So you know, changing our thinking is a really critical part of how we actually adopt a UX mindset into what we do, um, how we solve business problems, and how we create new business opportunities. And I think one of the things that's really important from this uh, fourth industrial revolution piece is really starting to think about how the lines between what it is to be human are starting to blur. We're going to start having conversations with machines. How many of you have conversations with machines already through Siri? I set my alarm last night using Siri as an example. So our concept of what, is, what it is to be human is evolving rapidly.
our bodies will be so high tech we won't be able to really distinguish between what's natural and what's artificial. Inside our own heads is the most complex arrangement of matter in the known universe. You might ask yourself, can we get to be superhumans? So it's an interesting thought. The idea of what it is to be human is going to evolve as a result of this. So when we talk about cyber systems starting to impact. So what's crucial there is understanding what's inside our heads. And that's the whole basis of um, human-centered design, is that we're trying to get inside what is going to be meaningful to us, both as a species, both as a business, both as a, uh, a, sub, a cultural subgroup, both as an individual. So um, as part of that, understanding functional needs is no longer enough. Understanding some of our symbolic needs, experiential needs, and our metaphysical needs are really starting to impact how we put applications together. So human behavioral data is very important. And if you think about um, some of the concepts that you actually experienced this morning in terms of Watson and that menu, you know, there are metaphor, sorry, metaphysical needs, experiential needs, and symbolic needs that, that were all mixed up in that experience. So, you know, we think about it as just being a meal. Well, what we tasted, what we heard, what we smelt. Um, at lunchtime, you get to see a very interesting thing in terms of smell and taste, by the way. So this chap here, um, Idris Murti, um, he's... Uh, He's written a book called The 60-Minute Brand Strategist. Talks in terms of how we need to understand these things um, from a, a more uh, symbolic level. For those of you that might be a, a little bit skeptical about that, here we have Simon Sinek um, and his golden circle. So Simon Sinek um, uh, is well known within entrepreneurial circles for talking about um, it's not what we do, but why we do it is what people buy. We want to work with people that believe what we believe. And that is the reason for successful companies like Apple, for instance, like the Wright brothers actually making some of the great leaps forward that they did, is because they really understood why, not the what. And this is kind of the underpinning to a lot of user-centered design, is understanding why somebody is doing something. <coughs> is crucial when you're building an application that is going to be meaningful. So I'm going to jump into what is user experience de design now. It's a philosophy and a method where the system adapts to the user versus the user having to adapt to the system. So it's very simple at one level but you think of all of those applications that you probably continue to use today where you have to adapt to the system rather than it adapting to you. You've got to figure out how to use something. I was looking at a, a medical health application yesterday and I was dumbfounded that, that um, a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old would be able to interface with this because it was just way too complex. Um, you know, it's extremely important that we start to think in terms of the users. What are the components of user-centered design? Sorry. One point here is it's, it's both an approach, a mindset, and an outcome. And so what are the components? Yes, functionality plays a part. Purpose, understanding why you're doing it is critically important. But the two pieces that are um, central to achieving um, a, an a fit-for-purpose outcome in the application of user-centered design are personas and understanding the user journey. So a day in the life of. You know, the cat that drank the milk, you know, that was spilt by the girl, you know, understanding what was going on in that household is going to inform and give you um, context where you 
can understand what sort of digital, social and physical touch points are important. One of the things that's often overlooked in my experience is the social aspect of all of the, the applications that we're using now. But social is a really key part of what we do. Gathering around a table to eat a meal is a social construct in our society. So how do you make your digital applications relevant in that context? So now we're tweeting our meals, we're taking photographs of our meals and putting them up on Facebook and Instagram. Social is very important in design. So all of this enables us to create experiences around what we touch, what we see, and what we feel. Coming back to that idea of an app that engages and delights. So user experience in terms of an outcome is actually all about retaining more customers, achieving repeat business, increasing levels of satisfaction, driving higher margins, increasing sales, and increasing value. And the outcome is this entire thing here. So what we consider to be value is also shifting. What we feel is important in the value chain going forward. So um, I want to give you some examples of where UX actually applies. So the first instance, and I apply it, or, or we apply it each day, when it comes to building digital demand generation um, uh, uh, campaigns, and actually physical demand generation campaigns, you use UX when it comes to capturing your market. You've got to make sure that what you have, the messages that you have to put out to market are going to resonate. Second area where UX applies is in delivering products and services to your customers. So, you know, if you think about Air New Zealand and the um, safety demonstration videos, there's an example of something that has really totally changed your experience of safety demonstrations. Um, and it's part of the service that you get. No particular material impact in terms of what you get to eat and what you, the, the seat on the plane, but it really does change your sense of what it's like to fly on that airline. You feel something, whether it's disgust or contempt or you just ignore it, you know, those are other things. The third place that UX applies is in empowering your people. So business to enterprise applications. So you might not think that um, user experience design has a place in um, what you're delivering from your IT department into your user base internally but how people feel about their jobs, the culture that you're creating is reflected in the applications that you're building to help them do their jobs well. So it plays a critical part also in empowering your people. And I wanna give you a short example here. Here is Burberry. Um, they have a flagship store in Regent Street. They wanted to design this store so it felt like walking into their website. So there's a large screen where performances take place, a lot of digital screens where you can view um, different products and feel the real thing there. You also have sales assistants that can actually um, pick up things out of your shopping cart and have conversations with you once you have identified yourself there. And they have these digital catalogs, these magical trays here where you can actually see that product, where it was made and the craftsmanship that went into the building of that product. So Burberry is a really interesting example of how the digital and the physical world um, is blurring. What we experience in those two realms is starting to change. So again, this concept of what it is to be human is changing. So in the business to business context, in relation to um, selling your services, why is UX important? Well, guess what we do when we explore, evaluate, and engage around products? We're driving our own searches. We need to understand what's relevant to our audiences so that we can actually capture market opportunity as they're exploring options, evaluating options, and ultimately engaging. To that particular point, um, Harvard Business Review uh, did a study where, where they show that 57% of B2B buyers are that far through the journey um, when they engage with you. you know, they're almost two thirds of the way through making a purchase decision before they actually engage with you. Very important if you're in B2B sales. If you're in the business of 
um, consumer, business to consumer. The journey that we go on now from when we're stimulated to take action around something through to a good moving off a shelf or moving into an online basket has changed in terms of what we do around search and reading reviews, watching video content, and here's your social component again. You know, in New Zealand, we are more likely to ask people than we are to necessarily get references directly off social media. But we are still performing the same action. We go out to our social networks to understand, um, uh, or to, to help us make a buying decision. Um, there's a great resource, if you have any interest around this, um, called Google Think, where it looks at all of the different um, tactics that are relevant on a purchase journey, and this is for the US, as we move from awareness to consideration to intent to decision. So um, in the States, for instance, display click advertising has relevance here, social here, email here, paid search here. There are a lot of pieces of data that can help us understand what's going on in the marketplace like never before. Um, and so what this is driving is, and again, if you think about it from a human-centered design standpoint, what we feel is really important do I feel expected when I walk into a store? And I want to show you an example of that. So it's no longer enough to know demographics because you can have a 50-something uh, man with a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, as Simon was talking about, and you can have a 20-something with a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. You know, these are factors that the demographics are less and less relevant now. Understanding behaviours are more and more important and stage of life, if you like. Um, and there's a lot more on this and how you actually start to put some of that into practice in James's um, session, who will be talking um, uh, shortly. So, you know, how we deliver to customers, actually developing member experience maps or customer experience maps are a big part of what user-centered design is about. So understanding that journey, and this is an example. By the way, these slides will be available um, afterwards as well. You know, it's very important when it comes to empowering your people that you take into consideration the physical environment that there might be. So, um, you know, here, here is an iris recognition piece of software. Um, not much use to someone like myself if that iris recognition um, camera is down here and doesn't have the ability to move up and down. Um, I'm sure those of you who are short and those of you of us who are tall all encounter these issues every day. But these are important considerations in terms of the physical environment in which we inhabit. So I just want to summarize this particular piece here. This is straight out of the, the video there that inside our heads is the most complex matter, sorry, complex arrangement of matter in the known universe. What we're trying to do with user experience design is start to understand what's going on inside people's heads. And this is a really fundamental part of how we need to build applications, how we need to build systems and customer experiences going forward. So I want to leave you with a few practical takeaways in terms of um, UX. 
very important in the UX process that you focus on users and tasks and the environment up front. Then you also want to make sure that there's a piece in there around empirical measurement and testing. And then there's also a piece around iterative design. I'm going to step you through an example of that or, or some pieces around it. So one of the first pieces in UX is learn about your customers, empathize. Second step in that process is really construct a point of view based on customer needs and insights around people. Then there is a piece here around ideating, so brainstorming as many solutions as possible. This is an important part of the process. Um, you also want to um, build a representation of your solution in terms of a prototype. And one of the things that Shane is going to talk about a little bit later is rapid prototyping um, and the bimodal IT model. So it's then also very important that you put these prototypes in front of people um, to test and get feedback. And it's an iterative process. There's just a key part here. And you need to allow enough time. So personas form a very critical part here. So understanding who someone is, what motivates them. So we have Emily here, who's an ocean advocate. Um, uh, the, the, the person that she is is going to inform the type of applications that are going to be relevant to her. We have here Patrick, who doesn't have a left arm. That's an important part of understanding um, uh, how you build a cyber system to help him the user journey that they go on, the types of things that they encounter. So in the case of Emily, you know, she's an, ocean, she's an ocean explorer. What are the applications that are relevant to her as she's out in the ocean? And in this particular case, there are tasks that this chap has to perform each day, like just getting a glass of water. You want to understand what are some of the challenges that he faces. Um, so use cases are very important. So um, in the case of Emily, what we're seeing is that she also needs to navigate using this app. And it's also going to be wet and wild out there. So it needs to be waterproof. Um, you know, and one of the things that's important in terms of using an artificial limb at this point in time is training it to do different things. And you can see here is an app from, um, that was developed with Apple around getting this hand to behave a certain way. So. Um, that gives you a sense of, of what's relevant um, in terms of UX. Who's who in UX? So those of you that have anything to do with IT and IT development, it's really important as we move from this user, human-focused um, view of the world away from the view of te technology and systems. In other words, how we bring those two things together that there are teams of people that play a certain set of roles in here. So around information design and visual design, there are different components in here. A user experience designer or somebody that plays the role of user experience designer is usually concerned with these things. A business analyst is usually concerned with information design and interaction design. Your graphic designer is concerned with interaction design and visual design. And your user interface developer is concerned with the front end, the interaction um, design, and the visual design. And then you have your back end developer. Now, these might be rolled up in a single person. But generally speaking, they're quite different people that drive this part of the process, this part of the process, and this, these pieces of the process. Um, I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to share an example with you um, of how this new style and culture has come together with an artificial intelligence app. And it's a segue into um, David's um, uh, presentation. So this is something I came across on Kickstarter. So it's got 24 days to go. Um, they were looking for $100,000. They've got three quarters of a million dollars raised around it. It is an artificial intelligence app that you'll start to see all of these components that I've talked about today come together. Cyber physical systems, user-centered design, um, iterative testing. It's a real and also an example of how you're seeing startups actually take advantage 
all of these cloud-based technologies, all of the things that are possible through something that David's going to talk about, which is Bluemix. So I'll just uh, introduce you to V. There is a little bit of a creepiness about the video, by the way, just to warn you. Hey guys, I'm Andrew, CEO of Lightning. We're proud to introduce V. It will transform the way you run, work out, and live healthy. V is the first true AI personal trainer, ready to help you lose weight, maintain your fitness, run your first miles, or push you to new levels. She lives in dark and severe forms. Put them on, and she comes to Bio sensors detect real time physiology such as heart rate and exertion. She also knows your environment like elevation, location, and weather. With this info, we can deliver tailored real time insight into natural speech. To make sure B and your music sound great, we partner with Carmen Carpenter with a beautiful sound to your ears. B has you run to the beat to find the right step rate. You can follow the immersive sound to get to the right pace. And you'll run through milestone beacons along the way to get updates on your progress. Thank you very much.